Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tamarack Institute webinar uh, titled, and I will bring up that previous slide, uh, Civil Society, Power, and Creating Bolder, Braver Social Change. Today, we're joined by Sue Tibbles, Sarah Thomas, and Sylvia Chu. I will do a brief land acknowledgement just to begin this webinar by acknowledging that we're meeting on the traditional lands of First Nations peoples. Uh, as part of the commitment to Canada's truth and reconciliation process, we recognize the importance of land recognitions as a way of honoring and demonstrating our respect for the diverse histories and cultures of First Nations people. I'm joining from the traditional territory of the Neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, colonially known as Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, we welcome you all to share in the chat box your name and where you are joining us from today. I will introduce Sylvia in a moment, but Sylvia, are you able to tell us who's joining us on the call today? Yes, I can. If you want to flip to the next slide, I think we've got a bit of a summary of all of you, because I know people are always curious. I do know that we have more than 365 of you who have registered for today's webinar, which is lovely, um, from virtually every province in Canada. Um, many of you from across the United States and a number of international folks um, from Africa, Australia, Finland, Jordan, New Zealand, Singapore, Spain, and of course the UK. And you can see as well on the slide, we've got a lovely representation of sectors and issues here, all curious about how to advance social change and the role of power in it. All right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, just to get us started, so Sylvia is our Director of Collective Impact at the Tamarack Institute. Uh, she has decades of experience in the field, uh, working in both Canada and the United States, and uh, is a very, very passionate change maker in her own right. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing what she uh, the, seeing the conversation she has with our two guest speakers today. Uh, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce you to the two guests we're hosting today. Sue Tibbles is the Chief Executive of the Sheila McKen McKechnie Foundation, and she comes to this role with almost 30 years of experience in the charity sector, as well as being a campaigner and a commentator with um, a commitment to driving social change and commit, uh, creating more powerful civil societies where people are working together. And the foundation plays um, a role in championing civil society um, by building changemaker capacity, undertaking work to deepen understanding and develop resources to advance the practice of social change. Um, and joining Sue is Sarah Thomas, and Sarah leads the Sheila McKechnie Foundation's Power Sharing Project. She brings to this work 20 years of experience in the charity sector where she's held a number of leadership roles in community and educational projects. And she's passionate about inclusive participatory approaches to social change that result in a kinder, more just and sustainable world. And she brings to this work uh, a master's in power, participation, and social change. Welcome, ladies. I can't tell you how excited I am to dig into learning more about your work and, uh, and what we can take away to strengthen our own individual and collective um, efforts around social change. Thank Thanks you. So much, Beautiful. So let me ask and get you to kick it off. Perhaps you, Sue, you can lead off on this. Tell us more about the Sheila, Sheila McKechnie Foundation and sort of the areas of focus that you bring to your work. Yes, absolutely. And thanks so much for inviting us to share some of our work here at the Sheila McKechnie Foundation. Um, as you say, I've always been a campaigner by trade and I have worked in charities, but I actually also worked in the private sector. People might know the body shop. I used to be in the campaigns team at the body shop nearly 20 years ago now. Um, and I worked around the United Nations um, and have worked with bits of government. So I guess I see myself as a campaigner, but um, working across sectors. I've been at the Sheila McKechnie Foundation seven years and we're quite an unusual organization in the UK. I think there may be more organizations like ours in other countries but people on the call will let us know but essentially our interest is in strengthening civil society in the UK to be more effective in driving change um, 
The foundation was set up in memory of an amazing woman called Sheila McKechnie, uh, who was a very high profile campaigner in the UK around housing and homelessness in particular, and also consumer rights. And she died too young, and the foundation was set up in her name 15 years ago. Um, and we have grown in that time from being first and foremost a training provider to actually now having a more complex model of how we try and build capacity in civil society. Um, I think that's right. We've got a slide if you could step on another one. Thank you. Um, our overarching goal is to strengthen civil society in the UK. The first thing to mention is that in the UK, there has been a very little existing capacity to interrogate how social change happens and how civil society could be more effective. So when I came to SMK, I was very struck that people tended to look to North America and Canada actually, primarily, to source um, insight and tools to understand how we can be more effective as practitioners. And it was really in response to that that we made it our task to try and understand how social change is happening in the UK. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about a foundational report of ours in a moment called Social Power. The Social Power report shows that the ways in which change happens are quite complex. So in response to that, our model for our organization is not that complex, but it's, it's three pronged and I guess hopefully systemic. So we, on the one hand, are a think tank. So we try very hard to both understand how change is happening. So we pay attention to um, trends and existing evidence, but a lot of our insight also comes from just staying very close to campaigners, whether they're big constituted organizations, grassroots movements, or just individuals. So we, we are really sort of watching the whole time to see how campaigning is taking place and learn from that. We also host deep inquiries into particular topics and the power work we're going to show with you today is one of those. So we are a think tank. We use what we learn to capacity build. So we do provide training and we are consultants and we work with a very wide range of people across civil society in our capacity building. But our third function is that we are champions, both of people that campaign well. So every year we host the National Campaigner Awards here in the UK. But we also hold a vision, if you like, for a powerful civil society, um, which in part responds to the fact that in the UK, the concept of civil society isn't really very strong. We're very much defined by charity in the UK. And charity, in turn, is seen to be quite a transactional concept of providing relief. I mean, I guess what we would call quite a Victorian in the sort of British tradition idea of, at worst, people with resources sort of giving alms to those without, you know, it's the sort of the soup kitchen and the relief and so on. As an organization, we are absolutely passionate about, yes, this sector is about providing relief, but we are also about driving reform. So as much as we want to attend to all the problems that people face, we want to be active players in trying to prevent those problems arising. Um, and so we hold that ambition for civil society in the UK. And we're also very active in trying to pursue that both through championing leaders in the sector, but also pushing back on challenges to civic space. And in common with many other countries around the world, our civic space is being very actively constrained. In fact, Civicus have just upgraded UK in their annual civic space monitor. We can talk about that if that's of interest to people. It's a whole other topic, really. So if we just step on another slide to our social power report, um, I guess we just wanted to share this in brief because it will be interesting to know how it lands with, with all of you guys out there. Because as I said, you know, our sort of driving question is how is social change happening and what can we learn from how people are successfully affecting change? And a really key learning for us was that civil society pursues change in really complex, diverse ways. Again, here in the UK, I can talk only really from the UK perspective because that's where we work. People tend to think of campaigning as primarily being around lobbying or advocating. They think that we drive change by appealing to decision makers or lawmakers. And actually allied to that is a sort of assumption that all the power sits with one group of elites, they're very often called, and that, you know, we the people, if you like, are sort of standing outside of that power, petitioning them. And we wanted to put forward what we felt was a more accurate picture of how civil society drives change that also brings with it a slightly different conception of power. So 
if we step on to the next slide, we have in our report, all of this is on our website, so people are very welcome to come and peruse at their leisure, but we have this tool in our report called the Social Change Grid, which is very, very simple, but it, it just seems to help people essentially kind of split out what can be quite complex sets of issues. So this is really just a tool to help us understand how social change happens. And so the logic of the model is at the top right is the public realm. You'll see that we've populated each of these, we call them quadrants, with activities that would typically take place in each quadrant. So the top right is the public realm. So it's large numbers of people working together to drive change. So it's definitely a territory that we would associate with campaigning. It's obviously changed fundamentally because of tech and social media. It's also though where we would have um, mobilization, where we would have protests and stunts. It's the territory of consumer activism that I sort of grew up with. So it's, it's large numbers of people. The bottom right, we have called institutional power. Sometimes it would be called formal power, but it's where people that are vested with the agency and the resource to drive and command change. So this would be the area of governments or the legal system or very big organizations that just have a lot of heft and influence. So it would, it would include very big NGOs as well. This is really, I think, where people tend to assume all the power is located. So it's the sort of formal power quadrant. Bottom left is service provision, which might seem counterintuitive, but for us, it's absolutely critical. So this is where civil society is working to try and change outcomes for individuals through service provision. So for us, we draw a distinction between services aimed at providing immediate relief. So we're not, for our purposes, looking at food banks or refuges but we're looking at the great swathe of activity that civil society actors undertake that help people turn their lives around and actually get out of vulnerable positions. And then the top left is the community, which could be a geographical place, or it could be a group of people that have connected online. And one of the simple points of drawing this out is to show that if you look at examples of how social change happen, they typically will use many of these tactics and work across most of these quadrants and typically lots of actors are involved so that's one sort of important point to just land another is that service provision is not separated out from campaigning which again and again i don't know if this is true in your countries but here in the uk people tend to think of campaigning and service provision as being somehow very separate activities whereas any analysis of change shows that by and large the springboard for the campaigning is experience and it is the evidence from working directly with people and in communities that is the impetus for change. So that's the second important point. The third point, which is perhaps most important of all, is again to recognise that that top right quadrant is actually where the power that really determines how social change happens is probably most important because it's the power that politicians in their efforts to be elected are responding to that pressure. And we know, if you look back through the history of social change, that civil society is, is driving most of the major reforms. And it's because we play an absolutely critical role in building the heat, because it is essentially heat in that top right quadrant that gives the impetus for change. So just look at Black Lives Matter, look at Me Too before that, look at climate activism before that, look at um, the campaign for equal marriage, women's votes, you name it, go back through time, not exclusively, but largely all movements driven by civil society. So in, in, in part, we at SMK are, are putting this in front of our sector to say, of course, there are vested powers, of course, there are elites, but we are not without power either. Power is complex. Sarah is going to talk about power much more than me, but let's bring, you know, a more um, sophisticated and powerful understanding. Um, so that's just a very, very quick snapshot of our social change report. Um, I think probably I should just hand over to Sarah at this point, but maybe a good way to segue between this work and the work Sarah has been leading on power is to say that um, even though there, um, there, are connect there is connectedness across these quadrants in terms of any individual campaign, it is also true to say that 
people that are primarily located in one of these quadrants and not another will tend to use quite different language. And actually, I think, Sylvia, you might have a poll mm. on it because one thing that we have found that is quite interesting is that people that are primarily in that bottom left quadrant, so what we've called the service provision quadrant, they often won't use language of campaigning or activism because it feels as if it's sort of sharp and provocative or even, dare I say, political, which, you know, is used as a sort of insult here in the UK or certainly a threat, you know, like, oh, my God, we're being political as if that's somehow, you know, not really acceptable. So um, one of the things for us was to interrogate more um, the questions of how we can open up social change. Mm. All actors can be involved. Some of you may, may well not see themselves as being activists or have any confidence to think that they are campaigners and social change actors. So I shall stop there and hand back to you for your next poll. Thanks so much, Sue. It's really interesting because I know here in Canada anyway, many of these nonprofits rely largely on government for their funding, which I think adds another dimension for timidness around, you know, advocacy or um, that kind of work. And in fact, for many years, um, uh, federally, if you chose to be too much of an activist, you put your own charitable status at risk. So, you know, again, feeding that dynamic. We are moving after this into uh, some Q&A. So if you've got burning questions, please take a few moments and keep adding them to the chat box so we can have a rich dialogue. All right, over to you, Sarah, because you were the lead about the Power Project. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you learned about the role of power in social change? Thanks so much, Sylvia. Um, so the first thing actually to say is that the Power Project didn't set out to be a project that was about power. We set out to try to understand what are the barriers to effective collaboration, what are the barriers to finding common purpose, and particularly um, what are the barriers, if barriers exist, and we thought that they did, to people that have first-hand experience of um, poverty and different forms of inequality was actually the question that we set out to explore, um, to, to uh, taking part, participating in social change. Um, and actually what we heard, um, we think represents a critical challenge to the way that a lot of social change organizations, particularly in the UK, operate. Um, we heard that lots of people um, that identified themselves as having lived experience or first-hand experience of poverty and inequality felt um, excluded by the bureaucratic processes within formal social organisations. Uh, they found perhaps they weren't able to access funding, um, they weren't able to access jobs within um, those formal charities and other social sector organisations, um, and those that were engaging with charities from outside of the charities often told us that their stories were being used in ways that were potentially tokenistic or exploitative. So we were really clear and we knew already from SMK's social power work that people with first-hand experience of injustice and inequality are already participating in social change. We know that all kinds of different people are involved in um, working in their communities or um, being involved in social movements in the public sphere and also using their experience. You know, some do manage to use their experience to get work in the more kind of formal bottom half of the social change grid, those two quadrants in the bottom of the social change grid. Um, but we felt that um, those people that were managing to do that were perhaps um, the exception rather than the norm. Um, so um, we wanted to explore more what were the barriers to um, more effective collaboration um, in, in social change organisations. And what we found actually was it's all about power. So often when we go out, when we set out to understand how to drive change, how to affect change in society, we know that that is about growing power or building power, you know, working in different ways to generate more power in order to affect more change. But what we found in the Power Project was that actually some of the barriers to effective collaboration, some of the barriers to working in really true solidarity with people with very different forms of backgrounds and experience, um, that also comes down to power. And so perhaps if we can develop a more nuanced understanding of power, 
then it might help us to develop more effective, more collaborative relationships that will then in the end enable us to drive more effective, more powerful social change within the civil society sector. So um, we really do believe that there's a role for the formal social change organisations. You know, we don't think that the burden of change can lie solely on the shoulders of those that are most um, disadvantaged or affected by injustice or inequality. Um, but we also have found very clearly that um, those social change organisations need to do better. They need to reimagine their work. And a lot of that means reimagining the relationships that they hold with people um, that they're working with in communities or with individuals. So um, we set out then to develop a more nuanced understanding of power. Um, and what we found, you know, we did a lot of research, we spoke to a lot of different people um, about their experiences of engagement, we spoke to academics, we spoke to all kinds of different people from all kinds of different backgrounds and communities. And the first thing to say is that a lot of the way in which we usually talk about power in society, certainly in the UK, can be misleading. So we often talk about speaking truth to power, and we may be talking about those institutions of power, of course, in that situation. Uh, but we also know that power is something that can be more individual. You know, we all potentially have an experience of feeling powerful in, in our families, perhaps, or, or in our kind of uh, more personal relationships. So power is clearly much more complex, much more nuanced than we would normally consider in, in um, the way that we talk about it. And it's also, and I think that this is really important, it's also inherently neutral. So we have come to define power as simply the ability to create or to resist change. We know that power is a very contested term. Academics have been talking about it for decades. There's no kind of clear agreement about what power is. Um, but we think that that's a useful working model to think about it as the ability to create or resist change. Um, and that means that we need to start moving away from um, a kind of more binary understanding about who has power and who doesn't have power, um, both in order to grow our power in the sector, but also in order to understand the power and privilege that we all have as individuals, particularly those of us that might be working in the formal social change organisations. Um, so once again, we've developed a couple of tools um, that we've been testing with different people and working through in different kind of ways. And just to say, you know, we are standing on the shoulders of giants with this work. You know, so we we have collated ideas. Some people might recognize the tools that we're using here. You know, we've developed things and we've also adapted things in order to suit the kind of UK audience that we're working with. Um, if we could just pop along to the next slide, please, Jamie. So the first of the tools that um, we have um, been using with people um, and in a very similar way to the way that Sue presented the social change grid, it's a very simple tool. Um, it doesn't really give any answers exactly, but what we hope that it does, it provides an opportunity to frame the conversation so we can start to have more complex conversations um, in a more straightforward way and hopefully then start to think more strategically about the action that we need to take. So the first of these tools that um, we've been working with we call the power lens um, and it's a very simple kind of nested systems model of how power operates um, within society and particularly within civil society those individuals and organizations that are working for change. Um, so if you think of the model as concentric circles, uh, we know that each of us as individuals have our own power to a certain extent um, that sits at the centre of this nested system model, and that this could be a result of um, our personal situation, our sense of power within, for those people that are uh, already familiar with that kind of language, or it could be a result of the position that we hold within an organization or within a group of people. We know also that when we join forces with other people, um, whether we create a formal organization, whether we join forces within our communities or whether we join forces on a massive scale to create a social movement, uh, we develop a kind of collective power. Um, so that sense of having more power when we're able to share our resources, share our knowledge, share our expertise and our networks together. Um, 
I think it's also really interesting to kind of just unpick at that point that whenever we collectivize, whenever we join forces, of course, power dynamics will start to exist already within that group of people. So power dynamics exist within our organizations and they also exist within our social movements, within our communities. So the third uh, sphere of our nested systems model is civil society's power. And that's what uh, SMK describe as social power. So it's the power that all of civil society has um, to drive change when it's working effectively and really importantly, without constraint. So we think of the civil society's power sphere as this kind of collective of all the collectives that make up civil society. But of course, we know also that civil society's power is constrained by power that exists within society. In the UK at the moment, um, Sue mentioned about the kind of threats to civic space, you know, some of the kind of democratic kind of threats that are happening in the UK, which are really affecting the right to protest, that kind of thing. So the structures of society and uh, of power in society are affecting the power that civil society has to affect change. And of course, the final sphere, the final uh, circle of the nested systems is societal power. And so that is the structures and the cultures of power that exist within society. And it influences our actions and our interactions on all levels. So it will, it will influence us as individuals within the organizations or communities that we're part of. Um, and it will also be playing out throughout civil society and that kind of dance that I talked about of um, the constraints and the capacity for change that exists is going to be playing out in really complex ways. So we think that most of this stuff is stuff that people already know, but we hope that by setting it out in this kind of way as a lens, it helps to identify um, the different kinds of power that's at play within our groups or within us all as individuals um, and helps us to kind of create a more strategic response. So we're just gonna have one more um, tool to share with you. Um, if we could just go along to the next slide, thank you. So some of you may recognize this is an adaptation of something called the Gender at Work Framework. So Gender at Work are an organization that are working um, uh, globally, looking at how gender dynamics are at play within different organizations. But we think that it is a really useful tool to examine how broader power dynamics are at play within organizations too. And you can see that the axes of the power framework are very similar. They're the same, in fact, as the axes that Sue introduced in the social change grid. But at the moment, the way that we're playing with this tool is to think about how power is at play within our organizations, within our, um, our collective uh, groups that are seeking to bring about change so that um, we can begin to understand more consciously how power dynamics might be affecting the ability for different people to get involved in the conversation, for different people to get involved in participating in social change or within our organizations. So again, we follow the same kind of two axes of the individual to the societal and then the invisible uh, to the uh, visible or the more informal and unpredictable and the more formal and measured. And again, we divide this framework into four quadrants, but the way that those quadrants um, operate is slightly different to the social change grid. And a key difference actually is that um, this includes our own individual uh, consciousness and capabilities. So we think that one of the really interesting possibilities that talking about power affords is that it requires that we start to do that kind of personal reflection on our own privilege and on our own power. So we think that if we want to examine the power that's at play within our organizations, um, we need to do the work individually on our own consciousness and capabilities. We need to interrogate our own assumptions. We need to develop our own kind of political awareness of our own position within society. But we also do the more, we need to do the more collective work 
I've just spotted actually um, one of the points in the chat, somebody talking about using um, acronyms. And so I'm just gonna hold my hand up now and say that's absolutely something that I need to be aware of. I use the phrase SMK. I know that I'm talking about Sheila McKechnie Foundation, but of course lots of people won't. And when we're working in organizations, trying to become more inclusive and more participatory, then the language that we use when we join forces together, the cultures that we create, the rules of the game that might be very obvious to some people and not obvious to others are going to make all the difference to who feels um, welcome and who feels able to participate. Um, just very quickly to go over the second two frameworks, the last two frameworks of the grid, when we first started talking about power as a means to creating more effective collaboration, we were talking about sharing power. And what we often heard were people starting to have conversations about sharing resources. Now, that's a really, really important part of doing that work of shifting power within our organisations. And it, you know, we have to start thinking much more strategically about how we can redistribute access to money, to technology, to jobs, um, open up social networks. Um, but we also need to start thinking much more creatively about what actually constitutes a resource. Um, so that's something else that's come out of a lot of the conversations that we've had. Um, and we know, though, from looking at this framework, that that idea about sharing resources is really only one part of this question of sharing or we prefer shifting power. Um, and then finally, of course, that very last piece is the policies and governance. And again, we think that a lot of um, the work that we might initially set out to do in our organisations is to rethink governance processes or policies, put a seat at the table. Uh, for somebody that represents the community that you're working with, or um, you know, write something into a policy document that um, creates more open employment procedures, for example. Again, it's all really important work, but we know, you know, in the UK, discrimination is illegal, but it still happens. So it's only part of the picture. Um, and we know that some of the kind of accountability processes that have been put into place that are much more funder led upward facing accountability processes can actually stand in the way of the more kind of um, collaborative solidarity led work that we're looking to do. So that's an awful lot, I know, to take in, um, but I hope that in the end, by looking at these kind of frameworks with time, when we can start to kind of I sometimes think of it as putting on our power goggles, you know, once we can start to view the world through this power lens, see the different ways that power is at play within our organisations, um, then we can really start to explore the fact that and understand the fact that power is everywhere. Um, and if it if power exists everywhere, then opportunities for change also exist everywhere. So if we want to create more collaborative organisations, if we want to work in more effective solidarity, then we would really recommend, you know, invite you to kind of have a look at how these kind of frameworks fit within your organisations, see what role you could play, what power you have as an individual to make a difference and make a start. Thanks so much, Sarah. I can see the opportunity for not only rich individual reflection, but also a really nice way um, to holistically explore the role of power in our respective organizations and movements. So this is really, really valuable. Um, my question, which kind of synthesizes both um, your work around power and also around social change, what, um, how do you think change makers need to see our work differently if we're really going to support civil society to be bolder and create braver social change? When you, say one of you might it off. when you say change makers, who, who are you thinking of, Sylvia? I think whoever designates themselves as that. Sometimes we see change makers advocating within respective organizations, be they foundations or, um, you know, within government, within their respective organizations. But it's also ordinary people, right, who want to be part of a broader social movement for change. So it really is. Whole, I would view it as holistically as possible. We all contribute to this collective work to advance um, society for the better. So how do we, as we approach this work, need to think broader, more differently, to really kind of realize the full potential, I guess, of social change and uh, power, harnessing that power, every, like the whole spectrum. 
I know it yeah. feels like a complex okay. question, but. That's okay. No, and we would completely row in with your understanding of change maker as there are many, many positions and, and roles for people to do that. I mean, maybe just to pick off two themes that I know are very live here and I think are alive, certainly in Canada, from some of the comments in the chat. So I think one of them is about the importance of all of us reflecting on the role that we can play in being more conscious of how power operates and thinking about how we individually can be active in trying to make sure that power is shifting in the ways in which we intend. Um, as you've understood from the way in which we've shared this work, we're very actively discouraging a sort of binary of giving up power. We even rejected the language of sharing power. We found it very difficult to find the right language for the work because much of the terminology in, that is at play is either predicated on a sort of binary or having it or not having it which is where even sharing power, we felt that we heard, for example, funders talking about giving up or sharing power as if it would sort of, all that they had to do was just pass everything down to the, the people directly affected by issues, say, and that that was, that was the responsible thing for them to do. Whereas we want to say, that's not honest because you do hold powers beyond just the money that you might pass over. But, you know, um, it's, as Sarah said earlier, nor is it the right thing just to sort of think, well, we'll just step out of this and we'll let the people directly affected sort of somehow sort it out. So everyone needs to play their part. And I guess what we're trying to encourage is a more sophisticated understanding of how that works, particularly with this tool that's still on the screen. I mean, the other thing I might just reference is some of the stuff that is at play between activists and between particularly the grassroots and constituted organizations where there is, for many understandable reasons, quite a strong challenge around the legitimacy of people in paid roles, people in constituted organizations, and certainly hear a very live conversation about the degree to which NGOs, constituted organizations are part of the solution or part of the problem. And I think that's a really, really tough challenge for those of us that are paid and in professional roles in constituted organizations and honestly you know I find myself torn because as a campaigner and in my youth you know a shaven headed quite loud quite at times aggressive not very balanced noisy young person I'm all for that kind of noise and challenge and disruption in fact, my son was telling me the other day that Greenpeace is a terrible sort of corporate sellout. And I was like, oh, God, <laughs> like, really? At the same time, I think, you know, we believe that the reasons why movements end up being constituted, the reason why organisations end up having hierarchies, the reasons why they have policies, why they have governance is often learnt through actually conflict and recognising that you need boundaries and you need clear rules and lines of accountability. So, you know, um, plus those organizations, you know, can play an important part and an important job. So I think where we are with all of that is, yes, let's call out what is manifestly a lack of diversity in our sectors. Let's call out, it can be really difficult to access those sectors, particularly if you're you know, from a racial minority background, if you're from a soci socioeconomically deprived background and so on and so forth. But let's not condemn social sector organizations because they're also critical to the solution. And let's keep our eyes focused on really good analysis of where in the end, if you're trying to shift the needle on social justice, on climate, let's be clear eyed about really where the opposition is to those issues. So let's reform on the inside, but let's not kill our ability to reform on the outside in trying to drive that change. But I know those are very contested issues. So maybe the chat box is going to start jumping around with strong opinions as we watch it. But Thank you so much, because I, I agree, you know, you've, you've done such a lovely job of not falling into binary traps and really recognizing that all of us, whatever position we hold, right, are all on our own journey. We all have a role to play and um, not letting perfection kind of turn us against each other um, and lose overall focus on what we're collectively trying to achieve. Um, really appreciate that. So 
Before we move into the questions, one quick one, because you guys have done some beautiful um, in-depth thinking about some really critical dimensions of advancing positive change. What's next? Where do you see the Sheila McKechnie Foundation really wanting to dig a little bit deeper or take this work a little bit further? Just a teaser. Oh, gosh. Well, look, if we, maybe Sarah and I are both allowed to answer that very, very quickly, because we might say different things. Um, Sarah knows that my personal interest is in trying to reach beyond um, our existing audience and into the wider public at large in the UK. Um, citizen, citizenship education has been taken out of our schools. It's very hard for people to access really good critical analysis about how social change happens. And I would love us to have more opportunity to speak into a wider public audience. But Sarah, what would you choose next? <laughs> Well, it's an interesting one. And, and Sue and I often come at social change, I think, from different ends of the spectrum. You know, so for me, I'm interested in the more kind of individual aspects of change and the, um, you know, really reflecting on our own consciousness and capabilities and focusing on strengthening the relationships. You know, I think if we can start thinking about strengthening the relationships within and between our organisations um, and hopefully using some of these tools to help that, then that will help us collectively to move forward. Beautiful. Well, I want to thank you both so much for being so generous in sharing not only these resources, but uh, the insights that led you here. Um, and I do want to turn us over now because we've got some really great questions in the chat box. Jamie, can you kind of lead us off? What are some of the questions that you're seeing? Sure. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> Uh, so one of them was from Carol Baker. Uh, how can social change advocates operate without threatening those who want to maintain the traditional power structures, particularly as an employee? You can't. You can't. So say a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Change, uh, well, power, um, you know, we define, defined as the ability to drive or resist change change is about disruption. So as people trying to change anything, whether it's trying to change the dynamics in our own organizations or the policies of a government or the attitudes of a nation, it's necessarily disruptive and it is necessarily uncomfortable. I think the judgment for campaigners is knowing how to behave and how much heat to bring into any given moment. So one thing we haven't mentioned, actually, is in that social power report, we have what we call the 12 habits of effective change makers. And some of them, you know, are maybe counterintuitive because they talk about the importance of, of stepping into other people's shoes, even people that may hold completely the wrong attitudes or opinions, people that we fundamentally disagree with. Our advice is stand in their shoes, try and understand why they've come to those views and their opinions. We've got a a line actually written on the wall of our offices from Abraham Lincoln that says, I don't like that man, I must get to know him better. So we, you know, we agree with that. And as Sarah mentions, so much of campaigning is really about relationship building because um, I personally have learned through my many years of campaigning that you should never underestimate the ability of people to change. People that have absolutely resisted and sworn blue that they would never ever support something have then gone on to do so. To give you a very clear example, actually, might I just say that the England women's football team have just got through to the final of the European Women's Football Cup. And I have to mention it because I spent seven years running a women's sports charity, the daughter of the Women's Sports Foundation in the US. So, you know, direct daughters of Billie Jean King and her campaigning and Title IX and all of that. Um, the sports sector, even just 10, 15 years ago, was absolutely adamant. There was no audience for women's football Obviously, a lot of people thought women couldn't play. They thought if they tried to play, maybe their womb would fall out. I mean, all kinds of nonsense. It has transformed in such a short period of time and a whole host of people that genuinely couldn't. Anyway, so it's just a very clear cut example. Um, so it, it is about disruption. But I think, you know, and it talks back to some of what we were saying about the nature of the activism within our sector. It's how we try and raise those issues and have those discussions without condemning, without um, caricaturing without basically getting people's backs up so that they're not open to change. Because in the end, for any of us to accept change, we have to feel that we're in a sort of, <laughs> that we're not actually being attacked and exposed. There are times to absolutely put the heat on. There are times to call things out and there are times to 
be angry and to protest, but there are also times for really soft skills and relational skills. And I guess part of what we do at SMK is try and un- help people understand that range and when to deploy all of them um, and point to how campaigning is a very sophisticated art form really and you know sort of interesting that there are um relatively few you know professional development opportunities for campaigners to explore these things that is great <laughs> uh sylvia i'm gonna i'm gonna look at the one of the next one we have two comments that relate a little bit to funding and and and, and money as as a form of power um, one of the questions is, um, has the Sheila McKechnie Foundation, and this is coming from Tamar Ibrahim, has the Sheila McKechnie Foundation used these capacity building resources to support grant making foundations to cede their decision making power to the communities that need their investments or that are in need of their investments? It, it sounds like a little bit like the uh, participatory grant making work that Tamarack has done. Um, sorry to pick this up again, but I think probably the work with the foundations has been, well, let me let me start and then Sarah might want to talk about one foundation in particular, but we've worked with a number of foundations more here to encourage them to, to invest money in social action and campaigning. Um, a bit like I was saying at the very beginning, campaigning had become almost like a sort of illicit activity here in the UK and trusts and foundations were extremely worried about you know, whether it was all right for them to fund campaigning even. That's begun to shift here. And so we have certainly advised some trusts and foundations on, you know, the fact that it is entirely legal and legitimate for charities and other bodies to campaign, um, you know, just help talk them through and the variety of forms in which it takes. In terms of participatory funding, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna hand over to Sarah because I think she is better placed to answer that than me. Is that something that you have a, something to add to well only, only to say so we have had conversations with um grant makers that are involved in participatory funding um and there are some really interesting organizations actually working in the uk that are really trying to kind of um push that ticket and, and to do some kind of really creative work um bringing funds directly to communities we think that's absolutely essential and absolutely needed uh, we think there's another part of the picture that uh, is perhaps overlooked, which is actually those resources that exist already, the, the um, social resources, the knowledge, the capacity that exists within social change organisations. Um, and this is absolutely not to say we want to divert resources away from communities, but we do think that there's a piece of work that needs to be done to encourage funders to invest in that kind of reflection that's really necessary for organisations to take on a more creative um, and more kind of effective role themselves within their communities. So the conversations that we've been having um, have been around strengthening organisations and moving away from um, uh, project-led um, output focused funding into really kind of strengthening the core of organisations and supporting that kind of reflective work. Um, but Actually, we're really excited at the moment on the back of the work that we've done, the Social Power Project and the Power Project. Um, we've actually now been invited to work directly with um, a grant making foundation over the next few years uh, to bring this uh, work alongside our kind of organisational development capacity building um, experience and our thinking around that. Uh, to their grantees that are working across the UK. Now they're all working specifically in the housing and homelessness sector, um, but we're excited about this partnership, particularly because the foundation is looking at um, systemic change. So they're moving upstream to try and understand what's causing people to fall into housing crisis or into homelessness. Um, this is just the very beginning of the project for us. Um, but one of the things that we're interested in, again, in terms of kind of building that relationship with the funder is um, what can we do to strengthen each individual organization's work um, and to strengthen, to help them to strengthen the relationships that they have with the communities that they're working with, but also how can we strengthen collectively across those different organizations to start building more strategic partnerships uh, to strengthen 
the um, funders own kind of strategic intentions in that area. Um, and there's just something to say again, I think, so part of that work is going to be learning, you know, our own learning. What does it really mean um, to encourage uh, learning to, for social change in a sector that really truly values diverse forms of knowledge and experience? Um, we think it's a really big question. I think it's a really important question to answer. And we're really excited to be exploring that alongside a funder um, because we've had some really uncomfortable conversations with funders around this issue of power. Um, we know that money is a huge source of power, but we also know that power isn't purely equated to money. You know, it's much kind of broader, much more complex like that than that, like we tried to set out. Um, and one of the things that we've found very kind of uncomfortable is when funders potentially try to kind of um well actually it's some of that language around kind of giving up power you know actually we're much more interested in what power do you have acknowledging the power that funders have acknowledging the power that organizations have acknowledging the power that individuals have and then how can we use that power more effectively to create more participation more collaboration and more effective social change Wow, I love the reframe uh, that you've given around how we look at power and how we have those conversations um, rooted in the reflections that each sector brings to the conversation. Ladies, I could keep this conversation going for a long time, and I hope you see from the chat, you've sparked a number of continued questions and reflections from folks, which is what we always want to see. Thank you so much for being so generous with your knowledge and your time and can't wait to see um, where your work with the funders and, and continued work overall takes you. I think we're gonna continue to learn from you. So thank you very, very much. Um, it has been an honor to uh, profile your work here. Amy, I'm gonna turn it over to you to wrap us up. Okay, pardon me. Uh, so as we wrap up, we just wanted to highlight some other learning opportunities that are coming up in the coming weeks and months. Uh, there are two workshops that we're hosting in August and September and October um, that can be found on our uh, event, the event listing tab on the Tabernacle Institute website. One is Turf Trust and Virtual Collaboration, which I believe our co-CEO Liz Weaver hosts, um, and the other is on co-design. Um, I will also flag that we have a few different courses available for those who are looking to learn at their own pace and deepen their understanding about concepts like the foundations of community engagement, foundations of collective impact, which I think uh, Sylvia uh, uh, hosts, and also partic uh, participatory evaluation. Um, and with that, I will just uh, let everybody know that we'll be sending a follow-up email in a few days with the recording resources that were shared in the chat box uh, and other relevant uh, other relevant information. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Mm -hmm.